Welcome to Life Matters. I'm your host, Brendan O'Connell, bringing you the broad mosaic of the Right to Life movement. And today we have a gentleman who's from Ohio, Columbus, Ohio, uh, by the name of Mark Harrington. He's the executive director of an organization called Created Equal. And he's got a unique uh, element or spin or, or niche, uh, market niche, and marketeers would call it, uh, in the, in the pro-life movement. And today we're going to find out what his organization is all about and, and what do they do to try to be effective to, uh, to change the hearts and minds of people across America to make them more pro-life friendly. Well, welcome, Mark Harrington. Thank you for having me. Uh, Mark, uh, may I ask, uh, first of all, how, how did you ever get involved in the, uh, the Right to Life movement? Well, I, uh, my, my first introduction was with Operation Rescue in the early 1990s when that was all winding down with Randall Terry. Uh, then I met Greg Cunningham in the Center for Bioethical Reform in 1998 when he began to use the Genocide Awareness Project, the GAP displays on college campuses, and I spent uh, the last uh, 11 years with CBR until we formed uh, Created Equal uh, in 2011. So, um, I mean, that's the short story. I've been at it for almost 20 years. Wow. Well, now, I noticed uh, I, when I'd gone to your website, I noticed you, you, you ballyhoo that you're a movement, not just a cause. What do you mean yeah. by that? Well, I think it, broadly, really, uh, we're not just a movement created equal, although we are, uh, but the pro-life movement is a movement, not just a cause. And what I mean by that is there are lots of causes. Uh, believe me, you know, you just watch television at night, you hear all the causes that are clamoring for the attention of the American people, and many of them are fair and just and right, uh, but some of them aren't. And, uh, you know, on Facebook, for an example, there's 350 Facebook causes. Uh, a lot of people want to be involved in certain things. Uh, in fact, there's a cause to end fa Facebook causes on Facebook. That's how, this, how absurd this has become. But there's a difference between a movement and a cause. And a movement is where you have a group of individuals that buy into something that's bigger than themselves. Uh, the civil rights movement was more than just a cause. It was more than just about uh, the injustice that was happening to African Americans. It's where people bought into the relational aspect of being part of something that was bigger than themselves, that they were willing to, if necessary, lay down their lives for. And that's really what we believe the pro-life movement is at, or should be, and we are just a small part of that, but we are trying to build upon uh, some of the social action movements of the past to bring back that element, that there is something worth actually sacrificing for and the pre-born uh, rise to the level of that type of action. Now, I, one of the uh, quotes that I found uh, rather interesting, I'd never seen it before, uh, you say that killing pre-born babies is nothing less than age-based discrimination. How is it that you came up with that and, and, and that perspective? Why did you want people to think that way? Well, I mean, it, it, it seems to me that uh, it's a message that's been lost uh, with the pro-life movement. It, it's, it's a very simple message. Uh, our name is created equal. Uh, that speaks of a creator, that we are created in the image of God meaning that uh, we are different, uh, that the human race, humanity, uh, gets its dignity from our Creator. Uh, that is the foundation for equality. Uh, and America is supposedly founded on the aspect of equality. Unfortunately, there is no equal rights between the born and the pre-born. And the reason we discriminate upon the pre-born is simply because they're younger. Uh, and the way that we propose this on a college campus, for an example, is we have a pamphlet that has Dr. King's infamous I Have a Dream speech uh, on it, and in it, it talks about how we believe in equality for African Americans, we believe in equality for, for uh, uh, females, uh, we believe in equality in a lot of other areas, but we don't, unfortunately, believe in equality between the born and the pre-born. We've discriminated against the pre-born simply because they're younger, 
because they're smaller, because they're located in their mother's womb, or they're dependent upon their mothers, or finally, that they're simply not as developed as the born. Those are age-based criteria. They are simply not bigger. Uh, they, are, they are less developed and uh, dependent upon their mothers and live inside their mother's womb simply because they're younger human beings. And that, is, that in essence, is age-based discrimination. I see. Now, uh, what kind of projects does your organization do and, and, and why do you do them? We primarily focus on one project. We call it a justice ride. We are a training program. Create Equal is a training program. Uh, we believe that uh, students, young people, high school and college, learn best on the job. Uh, however, we, we do teach them in classroom. We call that the seat work, where they're actually in a classroom. Mm -hmm. But the feet work, the actual on the ground on a college campus or high school campus, is the most important part. That's where students learn. So our program is not just classroom and it's not just outreach. It's combining both of those elements, those components, that are essential to learning and training up the next generation. And are these college students, are they trying to bring more college students into the fold? Are they trying to bring awareness to these other college students who might be just interested in studying for their algebra class? or? <laughs> That's what yeah, well, what we do is uh, we, we, we have several van loads of students that come from different parts of the country, and these are typically already leaders of the movement, but there may be folks that are just considering what to do, and we put them in vans, and we go on a road, and we go from campus to campus to campus, and we work with the student organizations that are on those campuses to facilitate our outreach event. And our purpose there is not only to train the young people that travel with us and train the student organization, but is to reach the campus, you know, and to save lives and change hearts. So, uh, you know, we're there for, for those purposes, training and outreach. I see. Now, I, I was reading a, a little bit uh, today about uh, you do leafleting uh, uh, around an abortion clinic. What, what is that all about and why do you do that sort of thing? Well, I mean, actually, in some ways, it's nothing new. Uh, you know, if you've been around the pro-life movement long enough, you've heard about people picketing abortionist homes. Obviously, we picket abortionists uh, or abortion centers. Uh, this is just an extension of that. Uh, what we do is we take uh, the, the photographs of, of a local abortionist, for an example, and juxtapose that next to a picture of an aborted baby. And then we put on this flyer, this little handbill, if you will, and we go door to door, and we hand it out in the abortionist neighborhood, or we hand it out in the neighborhood of the abortion clinic. And the idea is to simply raise awareness that there are killers among us. And that's the project name, actually, Killers Among Us. Mm -hmm. And it's my contention that abortionists lose the right or privilege to live a normal life, that they should be exposed for what they do, and I think there's no better way to do it than to show people what they do by juxtaposing their picture with a picture of an abortion and go into the neighborhoods in which they live and in which they operate their abortion centers. I see. Now, uh, I also noticed that you had something called a jumbotron. Yeah. Uh, well, what is that, and, and where, where, where would you use one of those? Well, you know, we, we helped pioneer the use of graphic photos. Of course, Joe Scheidler probably was the first way back with the uh, Pro-Life Action League and, and Jack Ames and all the rest that have been historically using uh, graphic images of abortion or abortion victim photography for decades. This is just the next step. Uh, a still photograph might be worth a thousand words, but a video is worth a million words. And so what we do is take these same images, which are normally put on still image, uh, still uh, posters or, or signs, and we put them into a video along with video of abortion, and we put them on a jumbotron screen, which is a 9 by 12, 9 foot by 12 screen, high definition uh, screen, and we take it to places like Washington, D.C. during the March for Life, or... Uh, this past summer, we were in downtown Cincinnati at our Fountain Square, or 
just last month we took it to a college campus for the first time. And the point of the matter is is that uh, America needs to see what they're doing to their children. And the best way to demonstrate that is for them to actually see it happening before their eyes. And that's what these videos do on a Jumbotron screen. Is the Jumbo... Uh, Tron screen mobile? In other words, can you, can this be going, be pulled behind a, a truck or something while uh, you're driving down the road, or is it usually stationary when you're showing it? Uh, they're usually stationary, although they do make mobile uh, Jumbotron uh, trucks, and, uh, you know, that's something that we are considering doing, but uh, for, for the purposes of the venues that we've been to, these are large uh, gatherings like the March for Life or any other kind of large gathering where a stationary display will actually reach people because they'll they'll typically walk right past it. Uh, but the idea of a mobile screen is something we are considering uh, to reach people where they are. I know I've seen that jumbotron down at the March for Life and it's uh, quite effective and what, Very powerful. Uh, yeah, what are the reactions you get uh, from the Jumbotron? What are people saying to you? Uh, I, I mean, I, I know everyone is, when they see the picture of an aborted baby, is repulsed, whether you're pro-life or pro-abortion, uh, which is a natural human reaction. But what, what kind of reactions have you got? Is there a wider variety of actions beyond that initial repulsion? Well, at the March for Life, we have a video on our Facebook page or our website that shows it. Uh, we, we captured all the reactions we could, and it's full of people either shielding their eyes in, in horror or in tears and shock of what they're seeing. So the responses are com you know, completely consistent to what they're watching, which gives me great hope because... Uh, that is the right thing. I mean, the fact that you're watching a baby being dismembered before your eyes should provoke you to tears. Uh, on a college campus, it's a little more mixed. Uh, we get those reactions as well, but we also get uh, the folks on the other side who uh, still, even in the, in the presence of that kind of evidence, hold to their views. Uh, so we're not out to, to convince those who are already... Uh, convinced one way or the other. We're out to reach that middle ground uh, that 50 percent or so, I think, of Americans and, and students generally who may just hold the default position of pro-choice because that's what they know, but they haven't really given it a whole lot of thought. The Jumbotron provokes the kind of discussion on a college campus that's necessary. I see. Now, uh, who actually gets abortions? Uh, do you have any statistics in that regard? Did at hand, or would you know? Well, the Alan Guttmacher Institute, which is the research arm to Planned Parenthood, says that 52% of all abortions are uh, committed by women under the age of 25. So that alone it shows you, it, you know, the large swath of the demographic that we're trying to reach on a college campus. Uh, you know, you're 18 to 25 fits in that, that uh, grouping. But there's also then the high school kids, and we can't forget about them. To be honest with you, in some ways on college campuses, these kids are, have already in many ways made up their minds on some of these issues, although I still think it's fertile ground. We have to increasingly reach uh, younger and younger uh, students in order to have an impact because uh, they're being reached earlier and earlier by Planned Parenthood, so we need to follow suit and be one step ahead of them. I see. And um, uh, when, when do abortions occur uh, during the, a pregnancy? Do you know, have any idea of when they occur? Do they first trimester, second trimester, third trimester? What, do you have any statistics on that? Well, 15% are in the second trimester and only 7% in the third trimester of pregnancy. That means, what, 88% or more, uh, I'm sorry, uh, around 78%, sorry, uh, occur in the first trimester of pregnancy. So the large majority are are in the first trimester. And that's why if you look at our website at createequal.net, 90% uh, of the images that we display are first trimester. They are. Now, do you get people saying, well, isn't it rather disrespectful to show images of uh, dead children? Uh, 
Doesn't it violate their dignity? Uh, yes, we do. And, and my, my response to that would be, actually, it's the most respectful thing you could do. Uh, that image is reattaching the dignity that was lost to that preborn child from the abortion because now you can tell that he or she was human and deserved the uh, rights that we all enjoy. So I think it's actually the opposite. It's not dehumanizing, it actually reattaches the humanity that was stripped during the abortion because you can still, even in the abortion, you can tell in those photos that these are human beings with, you know, uh, eyes and ears and nose and mouths and hands and feet, and, and that, that there, I think, attaches the dignity that was lost during the abortion. And, um, well, uh, why, why, do them, why do this outside uh, your presentations? Uh, why, why not do them in an assembly room where people can uh, receive the same message? Right, because no one, the, the folks that we want to reach will not come to us. Uh, if social action uh, or social reform history tells us anything, that is the dominant culture that is uh, in support of, of this type of thing and this injustice, which is abortion, uh, they're, 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 they're trying to ignore this. They want it to go away uh, so that if we were to, say, call for a meeting of some kind or a presentation, uh, on a college campus in a, in a lecture hall, uh, the only ones that generally would come would be the pro-life people. Uh, the pro-abortion, the abortion advocates just simply won't come to those because they just don't want to, they don't even want to have this discussion. They want it to simply go away. Uh, we won't permit that, so we've got to go out on the street. Uh, every social reformer has done that historically. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said he would shame America before the world. Uh, he made it a, a, one of his main goals is to, to make sure that the plight of African Americans uh, would, be, would be shown to the American people. He made sure photographers were there when, uh, when things happened uh, to them. So uh, we're no different than them. Uh, we've learned that uh, people won't come to us. We have to go to them. Consensual methods of reaching people or educating people are doomed to failure, uh, and if we rely on that as the sole way to, to educate folks, then, then we're not going to get the job done. Well, in part, that's why I'm on uh, uh, public access television, because it's uh, exactly a, a broad audience out there. Very broad audience, and it's a good venue. Um, now, what about uh, post-abortive uh, individuals? If you're showing these graphic pictures, uh, you know, it must cause them great pain, wouldn't you think? Or what's your what's your response to someone who would uh, cast right. that allegation towards you? Well, I think it's valid. Obviously, I mean, uh, if a, a parent has aborted their child, they should feel pain because of what they've done. We don't deny that, uh, but we would ask this question: If showing an aborted baby would prevent that same person from having a second or third abortion and, and, and prevent them from, from experiencing that grief and agony a second or third time, then would it be worth it? And the truth of the matter is that these images, when they're displayed, save lives and prevent people from doing this a second, third, fourth, fifth time. So that's number one. Number two, a lot of things will remind a post-abortive parent about their abortion. Uh, you, you can't just say that, you know, a board of baby photo will do that. Well, a pro-life bumper sticker might do that. The sound of a vacuum cleaner might do that. Just seeing children swinging on uh, uh, swings at a park might do that. So you can't blame the messenger. The problem is that the, the, these, uh, the folks that are post-abortive are dealing with pain. The only way to, 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 come, uh, to be healed from that pain is for them to come out with what they've done, admit it, uh, and then seek healing through the only one that can provide that, which is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I, I was going to ask you also, uh, there's, uh, in, in Albuquerque, you have a project, uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, regarding uh, late-term abortionists. Uh, how is it that Albuquerque has become the late-term abortionist capital of America? Well, uh, I think it's simply because Albuquerque almost has no restrictions on abortion. 
uh, it's it's an abortion free zone. I mean, it's a it's a zone where they you know a, a late term uh, facility or those who provide late term abortions are going to go to because they simply believe that the the government isn't going to do anything about it. So that's why they went to New Mexico to begin with. Uh, that's changing, as you know. That uh, hopefully, and your your listeners, your your viewers are are hopefully aware of the fact that on Tuesday, November nineteenth, that the city of Albuquerque will go to the polls and hopefully vote to outlaw twenty week uh, late term abortions in that city. So we're on the ground there. We've been there for several months on the University of New Mexico campus, working with the students on that campus. And we've been also with our two truth truck going around town with uh, a picture of a late-term abortion with the words, vote yes on the late-term abortion ban. Wow. I didn't realize uh, that uh, there was uh, an active vote that, that was going to occur. Yeah, on the 19th. So that's the a big day coming up. The 19th of November, I see. Yep. And... and um, uh, I've I noticed it, a lot of these uh, fetal pain bills are coming in now at about uh, 20 weeks, which is halfway through a pregnancy. Um, yet you're saying that most of the abortions happen in the 10th to 12th or 13th week. A large percentage of them do. Yeah. So what what are we? Uh, is is the late term abortion? Um, showing more of humanity? Is that why it's being accepted? Or do we have a confluence where we have um, these uh, pain-capable ab abortion bills that babies can feel pain at 20 weeks, like we've had passed in several states like Texas recently? What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think there are several reasons. Uh, I think that you touched on one of the main reasons, and that is a 20-week baby appears to be, quote, more human, unquote, than a, an earlier trimester child, and therefore it seems more horrific that we would be killing children that look more like us, I guess. So uh, in that sense, it proves my point that uh, if you can show a child in uh, the first trimester of pregnancy, uh, by the way, they look equally as human as a 20-week uh, a baby does. So... Uh, we've got to roll this back incrementally. I know a lot of people don't like that word, but uh, it didn't come here overnight. We've got to roll it back, and right now 20 weeks is, is a line to which it appears that the Supreme Court would, uh, would permit states, and in the, in the case of Albuquerque, uh, the, uh, the ability to actually outlaw it. So um, that's my take on it. I think it's a good thing. Uh, does it address the entire question? No. But Albuquerque is a different city now than it was four months ago before this whole thing began. And I can tell you, the people in Albuquerque know what abortion looks like now. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, interesting. Now, uh, uh, your voter education, uh, and we're, we're kind of coming to the close of the show, but your voter uh, education effort, you have the Jumbotron going around town. Do you do leafleting, too? And on these types of uh, issues? Yes. Yes, we do. Um, and I'll be uh, going to Albuquerque to be part of the final stages of that event. Door-to-door, uh, -door, uh, leafletting, picketing, everything you can imagine to get the vote out. Uh, we've been at the uh, early voting centers uh, with our signs uh, as, as people come inside to try to influence them right before they cast their vote. Uh, I think it's going to be a close vote, but I think we're going to win. I see. Well, Mark, how can folks uh, get in touch with you uh, if they're perhaps considering getting involved or would, would like the training that you provide uh, for their community? How can folks get involved? Well, simply go to createdequal.net, go to our contact page, and go ahead and fill that out or email us. Or you can go to our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash createdequal and go ahead and communicate that way. Uh, and I would just speak to any young people that are listening or their parents. If they're interested in joining us on a justice ride, that's where we go on the road for a week or two at a time and go from campus to campus. Uh, they'll never, for, never regret doing it. Uh, it is a life-changing opportunity for students to come together to coalesce around this, uh, this, in, this issue uh, and be part of something bigger than themselves, something they can really sink their teeth into 
and build relationships with like-minded warriors who want to be in the trenches and are looking for a battle to which they can join. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate your efforts, what you've done thus far, and hopefully we'll uh, expand it in the future. And folks, thank you for watching today. Uh, this is another element of the broad mosaic of the Right to Life movement. I hope you found today's show to be unique, informative, content-rich, truthful, and thought-provoking. Thanks for watching. I'm Brendan O'Connell, your friend for life. Thank you.